Americans are increasingly divided these days. Half of America has rebelled and revolted against President Trump these past four years. The other half are threatening to do the same if Joe Biden becomes president. Uh, there's racial tension. There are factions between man and woman. Uh, there's increasing hostility and brokenness between husband and wife and between parents and, and their children. And, and then we have riots and protests centering around some of the police and some of the citizens uh, going on throughout all the nation. We've invited our police department uh, to be in our church today uh, because we want to bless them. Not only do we believe that it's clearly taught that Christians are to obey governing authorities with the assurances that the governing authorities and law enforcement are placed literally by God for our safety and our best, uh, but as the pastor of the church, I want to thank the Wichita Falls Police Department. I think they do an incredible job. I think they exhibit some of the very attitudes we're going to talk about today that talk about attitudes between a supervisor and a subordinate. And, and to gain these understandings, I think, is life changing and I think our police officers do an excellent job in this area. Now the most common passage that you see when it comes to governing authorities is found in Romans 13. Let's just look at that verse. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities since there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. We looked at several key points on that passage when I preached on it a, a little while back, and it, it is one of the most common topics when it comes to, to law enforcement and the government. But I actually want to look at some heart principles today that I think are a little less taught uh, that can be very much applied to police officers, to governing authorities, uh, to every kind of relationship. And I think both our congregation and the police officers who are with us in our church will find this very enlightening and very wise and not always taught. So the last two weeks in our church, we've been looking in Proverbs 1 at how to be wise in a foolish uh, world. And today we're going to talk about how that wisdom can be applied in relationships. And so I want you to look at the first point in your outline, and I want to start by reading verses 15 through 21, which says that Christians should seek wisdom, and especially in the area of applying that to relationships. First, uh, Ephesians uh, 5, 15 through 21. Pay careful attention then to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. These go so well with what we've looked at the last two weeks. And I want you to see how these verses give the heart attitude and, and the below the surface heart attitudes and knowledge from God on how to live out and please the Lord and then how that relates to every uh, relationship, how it fits every single relationship we're in. Look at the idea of verse 15. The idea in verse 15 is therefore live carefully so as to be wise and thus please the Lord. The translation for verse 15 could say uh, pay careful attention or the translation say be careful how you live or they might say um, be careful and examine how you're living, but literally it could translate like this. If you just took it word for word, look therefore carefully how you walk. Christians are admonished here, uh, listen, don't be unwise, don't be foolish, just like we saw in Proverbs 1, but instead it says to live wisely. We're to live like the people we are. We 
uh, in Christ we are one. Christians are one. In Christ we are separated out from a foolish world. We are love. We are light. Uh, we are to be wise. What we do in relationships should uh, correspond to who we are and, and how the Lord's relationship with us looks. So when Christians sin and fall into Satan's traps, we do so because we're not being careful to avoid living as unwise rather than wise. So we can, we can actually please God and live accurately uh, in this way. Look at verses 16 and 17 because I want you to see two more phrases on that. Making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. N notice this uh, first phrase, making the most of the time. Or the equivalent of that, if you want to if you want to look at, at the words and look at it more closely, it would say redeeming. It has the idea of redeeming or buying back the set time God has given us on this earth. It's easy to start a lot of things and not finish well. Very, very easily uh, to start and not finish well, whether it be in athletics or academia, music, business, or personal or spiritual realms. But this says we must carefully and single-mindedly continue pursuing God, pursuing his word, pursuing, applying those in relationships with others. We need to redeem or, or literally the, the, the word that means to buy back every moment God grants us while on earth. We only have a set time that is ordained by God for us while we live here. So we need to be careful with that, be, be very focused on that uh, in our, our lives, very, very careful attention given to how we spend that. And notice the second phrase, why we do that, because the days are evil. If you look at that uh, more closely, I won't go into all the, the word phrases there, but basically foolishness, hate, godliness, godlessness and pride and such are all around us and they're easy for Christians to accept rather than to set apart ourselves from these things. So we need to make sure to be careful uh, that we live in that way. Now I want you to think about it this way. It's easy for us to picture when he came here, Jesus had been the son of God and he came to this earth for a short time to redeem every moment of it, to, to literally buy back every moment, to buy back uh, what sin had done. And Jesus, one of his favorite phrases here was being called the Son of Man because God literally came down the flesh and was born the Son of Man. So he knew what it was to be the Son of God and then he discovered what it was to be the Son of Man. And when you think about it, we say, well, of course Jesus knew heaven and everything before what he was created for or what he had always been in heaven. And when he came here, he knew he was here just for a short time to accomplish the Father's will. Put that in relation to those of us who are in Christ. We are born the son or the daughter of man. Uh, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we become a son or daughter of God. So Jesus was the son of God who discovered what it was to be the son of man. Christians are the son or daughters of man who learn what it is to become the sons or daughters of of God, and we too are here just a short time. We tend to live as though this life down here, these 40, 50, 60, 80 uh, years that we live down here are everything, but really we are buying our short time here. The days here are evil, but we want to be very careful how we live in relationships and how we wisely live so that we can buy that time we're here before we go back as sons and daughters of God to live in eternity. Look at the next thing on your outline. Rather than being stared by controlling influences, we are to seek the filling and control of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 18. There's a lot more in the actual Greek in these words than you get in this simple sentence. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. 
That phrase, which leads to reckless living, is also translated leads to debauchery or leads to excess or leads to riot or dissipation. Those phrases point to drunkenness as one of many broad controlling influences. It's trying to give the picture uh, of how uh, we're to be living in the Holy Spirit than these bigger influences that control us and can lead to uh, difficulties and reckless living and, and things that tear apart. Have you ever heard the phrase that that person uh, just lives a, a, a very difficult lifestyle or they're destructive in the way they live? And that's what this says. There's so many controlling influences that can lead to a destructive kind of lifestyle. And it's easy to become addicted to those things rather than live in the Holy Spirit. It can be alcohol, it can be drugs, it can be power, it can be sexual sin, it can be money. We live by hate. All of those things can change how we act, leading to sin and foolish addiction. But as Christians, we're to walk carefully in God's wisdom, and then we're to seek daily for the Holy Spirit to fill and lead us. Look what Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. Quite honestly, when I hear many times of there being conflict between police officers and citizens that ends up going bad, I can't help but observe it's a common thing. Those citizens were at the wrong place at the wrong time doing wrong things and then proper, uh, improperly responded to a police officer. And you get in a moment there where uh, there are decisions that have to be made in an absolute moment, and that citizen has put themselves in a dangerous position because they've not been wise. They're not, uh, I, I could point to very few, if any people ever hurt by a police officer that was walking in the Holy Spirit and the love of God and his attitude. So I want you to see the central truth of these verses because you'll see how we'll build on these, how, how they're exemplified and how those fit into what we're looking at today. Look at the central truth. Spirit-filled, wisdom-seeking Christians give continual thanks to God for all their circumstances, everything. They embrace an attitude of mutual submission to other people. Whether as supervisor or subordinate, this is how we imitate God and walk in the love of Christ. Notice that first phrase again. Spirit-filled, wisdom-seeking Christians give continual thanks to God. No matter what we're going through relationally, what circumstances we find, or in, find ourselves in, how difficult things might be with others, we're, we're always giving thanks to God if we're spirit-filled and wise. And we embrace an attitude of mutual submission in every relationship we're in. That central truth is key to every relationship. It fits whether you are the leader or whether you're the follower, or whether you're the authority figure or, or whether you're the lesser figure in that situation who does not hold authority, whether you're the supervisor or whether you're the subordinate in that. Look back at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, Christians, this was written to Christian church in Ephesus, Christians, therefore Christians, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Now look at verses 15 through 18, again in verse 21. Pay careful attention then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So then don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is, and don't get drunk with wine, wine which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Verse 21 is key. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. An example of this kind of mutual submission and care uh, it was exemplified recently with my wife and a police officer. Boy, she was headed somewhere and she was headed down Taft and she was booking it and all of a sudden she looked up and there was the police lights. Police officer said, you know why I pulled you over? She goes, was I going fast? And he said, you were going 48 in a 35. She goes, oh, my. And she laughed. She goes, boy, I blew that one. Well, I got that coming. And she said he was the most polite. He was respectful. 
and he said, listen, this is going to be okay. He knew she was kind of upset. Man, this is terrible. I've not had a ticket before. And, and he said, listen, if you don't have any previous citations, you're fine. She goes, I don't. And he says, and I guess it goes without saying you're not drinking. There's nothing in the car. I need to be where she goes, no, I'm a pastor's wife. And he goes, oh, oh, wow, man, I'm so sorry. And he goes, well, I feel bad. Well, he went ahead and he processed it and got her information, went back to his car, and he came back and he gave her a ticket. And, and my wife said this, she goes, I wanted to wait until after you gave me the ticket because I, I deserved it. But she said, I need you to know, uh, I really respect what y'all do. And our church is very supportive of police officers and you have a hard job and you get a bum rap on a lot of things. We just want you to know we appreciate and know beyond what we could understand that it's just a hard job. He said, oh, I feel terrible. But he gave her the ticket. There was mutual relationship there. They connected with one another. There was respect shown. There was a mutual submission. He didn't carry an attitude that he owned her. He was trying to punish her. He's very gentle with her. And uh, you'll see in the next point in our, our outline and these next ideas how important mutual submission is in every relationship, whether you're the leader in that or the follower, whether you're the officer who has the authority or a citizen who doesn't. And so I want you to see this next section. These are called house codes. They're called house codes here in this next section in Ephesians and also in Colossians and 1 Peter because they are, are literally wisdom applied in our most common social relationships, the ones of that day, certainly. And so with that in mind, let's look at mutually submiss submissive relationships exemplified. We're, we're going to summarize these because I'm not going to teach all the details of these. I'm going to give you a basic summary because we've heard these taught many times in church. But let's look at these most common social relationships and how the principle we looked at, the central truth, applies in these. Look, look at the first one with the wife and husband. Notice the first point and then we'll read those verses. The wife is to respect and respond to her husband with a clear commitment to his authority. The husband is to love and lead his wife with a selfless and sacrificial love that always seeks her best. Look at verses 22 through 33 of Ephesians 5. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, Husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm really talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Notice here that the wife is not told to obey everything her husband told her. She's not to count herself inferior. She's not inferior to him. There, there is equality, uh, and, and she is, is merely told to submit uh, to him. That's her service as to the Lord. It's her service to the Lord to, to fall. It's a word that means to fall in rank under, to, to just acknowledge he is the authority. So she recognizes that God has placed him to be the head. There's no problem with that. She respectfully responds to him, doesn't compete with him, doesn't try to undo him or usurp him. She loves him. The husband then is commanded maybe with a harder uh, command. He says, you're to love your wife with the same unselfish and sacrificial love, literally an agape 
love there that Christ had for the church. It's not one person commanding adherence to the other person. It's not a, a battle between who's in charge and who gets their ways. It, it is a submit love relationship between both of them that is a beautiful mixture of harmony and partnership in marriage. You always, in every relationship, have to have one basic initiator or leader and followers. There's always that dynamic anywhere you go. Look at the next relational example of the central truth we have of this mutual submissive love. Children are to obey their parents as authorities. Fathers are to not exasperate but train children in the instructions of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, do not stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. For a child to obey parents is pleasing in the Lord's sight. According to verse 1, he says it's right. It's just right. That means it, it is the wise and proper thing to do. It's that which pleases God. It literally carries the promise of a long life because I, I often note with children that the way they treat their father and their mother sets a tone for way, the way they respond to authority or the way they are as an authority figure someday, the way they treat their wife or husband, the way they treat their children, the way they treat their friends. And so to do that and to build that discipline and that stability of obeying parents it leads to longevity and stability and, and blessing in life. Fathers, who in this passage, it could be fathers and mothers, but fathers kind of represent the ultimate authority figure in the family. They're not to provoke their children to anger or to exasperate them through unreasonable demands or petty rules or uh, uh, control that seems to be for control but not out of love or favoritism. There can be a number of things a father can do that does not show love and acceptance of a child. Instead, they should be guiding and correcting and disciplining and training them. And their stand should always point to the higher reason that we do this because I do it under the Lord and I expect you to too. That's what we're instructed to do. That leads us to the last uh, group here that they cover there. Notice this last example of this kind of mutual submission. Slaves were to obey their masters with respect fear and sincerity under the same authority as to the Lord. Masters were to be an example to their slaves through being just and fair with impartiality and equality in order to please the Lord. Look at verses 5 through 9. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. I want you to notice that I need you to understand there were two groups. Sometimes the Bible distinguishes between the servants and the slaves. Slaves were slaves as you understand them, and we more commonly understand without their will, with no rights, no privileges, no relationship. But a lot of people were servants. It was very common to be a servant in that day. There weren't bank loans and credit cards, and you couldn't declare bankruptcy in that day. So there were extremely wealthy people, and then most of the rest of the people were dependent and in some way were servants to those people in order to eat, to have a place uh, to live, to, to get some kind of wages. And, and so in the midst of that, you could have both groups. 
And the idea was when you were in servitude to another person who in a sense was master over you because you were indebted to them or they provided you a place to live or that's where you got your food uh, in that day, it says you were to have a righteous and Christ-like attitude and to serve your master just like you would to the Lord. Not just work when he's watching, but to work heartily to try to bless him, to do what you do with an attitude that I want to bless him just in the same way I would serve my Lord. And the, the master, who is a Christian, is commanded, don't ever threaten your people. Be fair and be just with all of them. And, and you're to treat them just as the Lord, your master, treats them and treats you and so if you look at these, these take us back to the central truth. I want you to just listen to it again. Spirit-filled, wisdom-seeking Christians give continual thanks to God, whether they're the subordinate or whether they're in charge. They embrace an attitude of mutual submission, whether as supervisor or subordinate. This is how we imitate God and walk in the love of Christ. With that in mind, I want you to look at the application of the central truth. How do we apply that truth? How does that fit adequately for a day like today on a police appreciation day in our church? Look at the point. Whether the leader or the follower, Christians who practice love, equality, and mutual submission in relationships are highly pleasing to and approved by the Lord. The Lord accepts every believer. But to be approved by God is to grant his favor. It's for him to be thrilled with you. We can, we, can, uh, we can accept a child and not approve of their lifestyle, not be directly connected or supportive of the things they're doing, but to approve of a child, to be involved in that way. And that's what God says here. And so in every relationship, I want you to think about this. You're always a leader or a follower. Even a child is a leader to younger children. On a team, whether a coach recognizes you or not, there are some people who rise to be more of the leader while the others follow them. And in the midst of this, we are to always respect both the leader uh, and the leaders to respect the followers. So we're to respect whoever our next president is. Whether that be Biden or Trump, Biden uh, deserves to be respected and acknowledged if everything works out as the next president. He deserves to not be opposed through his entire four years. I do not think it's appropriate ever for a Christian to say support wasn't given one way and I will in no way support him. That's not what these scriptures teach at all. If Trump ends up... Uh, he has a right and a legal obligation to pursue the legality of these votes. And it's wrong for anyone to say he should not do this or his motives are wrong behind doing it. He should, he should be treated with that same kind of respect. Neither of these men have shown mutual respect uh, for one another. There should also, also be a mutual respect and submission between husband and wife between parent and child, with a parent seeking to edify and point that child to Christ and that child seeking to please and obey their parents in all things. It's interesting how that dynamic works in a church. In our church, I think it works exceptionally well. Our overseers are the top supervisors in the church. They have the final say in everything. The deacons are servant leaders. The deacons understand they don't make those final decisions, but it's amazing if things get tight, the overseers will say, we don't deal with as much of our church and our people as the deacons do. Let's go to them and we need their input and we need to see their observation because they represent the church so well. There's so many of them. So there's no fighting back and forth. There's no fighting over who's in charge. There's a mutual submission. There is a great respect that overseers have for deacons and vice versa. I've had young staff before say, what's it like to be the top dog? You're over everybody. So when you come to become the pastor of the church, if you have any Christ-like attitude in your heart at all, you begin to say, I answer to everyone. 
I, I work really hard to have an attitude that I listen to every person regardless of their status or their position in church if they have an observation to listen to them. So on these situations you can see how there is a dynamic there where a husband doesn't compete with his wife and his wife is his husband and the parents don't try to dominate the child and the child is not trying to run their parents and this works at school with principals and teachers and coaches and students and athletes. This works on a job with supervisors, managers, bosses, and the office structure, mutual submission all the time. If you're in charge, show mutual submission. And if you're uh, looking up to someone who's over you, do the same. I didn't tell you the rest of the story with Robin and the police officer. He told her, he said, man, there's things you can do to get this taken off. You can take classes and things, and you can call this number on Monday and find out what that is. Well, Robin came home. She felt really bad about uh, getting the ticket. She was very impressed with the police officer. said he was the nicest man, made me feel so good. When she called the number Monday, they said, that, that ticket's been dismissed. Now listen, if you are in this church or associated with us and you try to go out and manipulate a police officer to dismiss your ticket, you will have missed all the point of this. That was not Robin's goal whatsoever. But what happened is there was such a mutually uh, respectful relationship. And I think it reflected on the police officer way more than my wife. He just said, listen, I, I think she got it, and I, I don't think there's a need to pursue this. And I'll tell you this, that ticket still sits on top of our desk. She's kept it there, and she looks at it, number one, and says, thank you, Lord. Thank you to our police officers, number two. And then when we drive down the road, she says, I don't speed anymore. And, and so it accomplished its will, and I want to thank our police officers Someone recently speaking said, I've lived in several cities and some of the officers in some cities are as mean as the media portrays them. I wouldn't trust them at all, but he said, I moved to Wichita Falls and the officers here are different than the ones I've experienced in a, a city or two. They're very respectful, very courteous, uh, very kind, very relational. That's a reflection on our police leadership. That's the experience I've had with every officer I've ever dealt with. When the police chaplaincy began some years back, I rode and was a part of that for four or five years and rode with police officers and, and experienced firsthand some of the situations they find themselves in where there have to be split minute decisions and the difficulty and the people they come up against and how hard that is. So today, out of all of this, we realize that whether it's a police officer or a citizen, there can be great harmony. Whether it's our politicians or the citizens of the United States, there can be uh, mutual respect and harmony. Whether it's husband and wife, parent, child, whether it's a, a supervisor, an employee uh, who's over someone. And in the midst of that, regardless of the circumstances, the emphasis here is not on if somebody acts perfectly on the other side or if the supervisor uh, treats us justly and such. The idea is to do what we do unto the Lord. And that is how wisdom fits in every relationship uh, we are in. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as Christians, we want to thank you for our police officers. We want to thank you for law enforcement. We want to thank you for our city leaders, our first responders. We want to thank you for these principles that uh, I think teach a very, very important life-changing, life-transforming truth and then are exemplified and then can even be exemplified, though uh, not specifically shown in this scripture, they can be carried out and shown uh, with our law enforcement and citizens here. May, as Christians, may we love in a way, may we have thankful hearts in a way, may we show uh, love and respect and everything we do as unto you that it might be pleasing to you and it might imitate uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.